Good morning, everybody. It's 9.15, so uh, let us start. So what do we have on the menu today? <clears throat> First, I will finish what we started on ranked retrieval, which mostly had to do with what model? Wake up. So how, how did we do ranked retrieval, the mm -mm model? OK, vector space model. So we used a lot of linear algebra, so a lot of vectors and a lot of scalar products. And we used the scalar products in order to uh, measure the similarity of two documents. So you probably remember the scalar product is 0 when it's exactly orthogonal, and it's 1 when it's exactly aligned, provided it's normalized, of course. Um, so what we end up doing is simply trying to compute the scalar product of the query and the documents. And why does it make sense to talk about the scalar product of a query and a document? Simply because you can represent the queries and the documents as vectors. So the world is in order. We are computing the scalar product of vectors. And uh, I spent a lot of time explaining to you how we can compute this. We can use almost the same kind of structures that we've been using for the Boolean model the standard inverted index, but we enhanced it with more information, the term frequencies, the inverted document frequencies, and so on. And then all, we, all that was left to do, so we have, I need to remove the transition. I don't know why it puts them back every time. There you go. So what we end up doing in the end is simply Computing the scalar product, so huge scalar products, um, using this kind of structure. And the way we do that, it was very simple. We just need to understand that we need to sum over the terms. Why? Because the terms correspond to the basis of this vector space, so the terms are the coordinates. So we, know we needed to sum this thing here, which is a scalar product, which is one term of the scalar product indexed by t, q, and d, and we need to sum that over t. So each, for each d and q, we sum that over t, and that gives us the scalar product. Right? Who, who is following on t now? Who is following? Right? We've already been doing that. And now we are in this next part of the lecture, part 8, where we try to simplify how we compute this thing. And the way we simplified, I showed you that last time, we can get rid, we can get rid uh, of q here, because it's anyway only depending on the query. Uh, then we can divide by the document length at the end. Then we realize that we only need to maintain accumulators for the query terms. We don't need the terms that are not in the query, so we have less. And then we also notice that for the query, the terms will only appear once or, twi or, once or zero times, so we can also get rid of this. And then we can also get rid of the inverted document frequency on the, si on the side of the query. So we end up with basically summing over TF TFIDFs. This is the main thing that we remember. One of the ways of doing ranked retrieval with the vector space model is to sum over the TFIDFs, right? Uh, but there's many other ways, and you probably remember that I've shown you a whole restaurant menu with plenty of other alternatives to TF and IDF, so there's plenty of different ways. It's called SMART, and uh, you have these letter codes in order to say what you do. So this is not the absolute truth. This is not the only way that you can sum over the weights, but this is probably the most famous one, the, the, the most taught one and the most famous one. But you should be aware of the others as well. Um, OK. And then we looked into, we started looking into inexact top K document retrieval, for which I have a question. Where's my pointer? Yeah, here. Yeah, of course. Give me one second. My computer needs to wake up as well. That is strange. No Wi Fi. Oh, I th 
it seems that the Wi-Fi is experiencing issues. Let me try the other one. Otherwise, I just ask you the question just like that, directly. So let's try the other one. Okay. Ah, this is very annoying. Ah, yes, there we go. Just need to enter my password and we'll be there. So you see, we are in the 21st century and we believe you have all this technology, but there is still a long way to go in order to, uh, to make it work completely seamlessly. So I think your generation will still have some very interesting uh, research to do. Okay, so let me just ask you directly and I'll, uh, I'll try again, maybe a bit later. So uh, my question was, why do we need inexact top K retrieval? Why is this a good idea? Can it, anybody tell me why this is a good idea? Yes? Yes, exactly. This is one of the reasons. If you want to do the top K, the, the real top K, and you have billions of documents, that's a lot of computations you need to do in order to retrieve the top K. We saw that we can make it a bit faster. And one of you asked an excellent, questions, an excellent question last time is, why is it not head log N? Because if you want to retrieve the top K, you need to sort the documents by scalar product with the query. And that means that um, it's N log N in order to sort. But the thing is, if you only want the top K, K is a constant. It doesn't, it's not linear or anything, it's just a constant. If you want the top K, what you can use, use is what kind of data structure? Yes? A priority queue, and how can you implement that, for example? So a priority queue is the abstract data type, and you have an implementation? A heap, exactly. So you can use a heap in order to uh, store everything in there. You can build a heap in linear time, very powerful. And then all you need to know is take off the heap k documents and you're done. If you would do all the n, that's n log n, but then it's k log n because you only want k documents. Who is with me? Okay, so it's very efficient. So it's linear plus logarithmic. So we are able to retrieve the top k from a very large quantity of documents. But it's still it can still be very, very slow. And as you said, the way we can improve that is to pre-select a few documents, a much smaller list from the overall list of documents, and we only compute the uh, top k from that smaller list. Um, so you would think that's basically g going to give you an approximation, right, of the, uh, of the, um, of the result. But why is it actually pretty good? Why does it work in a pretty good way? In other words, I can maybe formulate the question in a different way. Um, why is the vector space model already an approximation? Yes? Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's exactly the idea. So in the vector space model, as any time we implement something, we abstract away. And um, what we are doing is that we approximate what it means for a document to be relevant to a query. We approximate this with vectors and scalar products. 
we say the cosine of the angle, which is the scalar product of the renormalized vectors, the cosine of the angle is a very good proxy for the similarity of two documents. This is an approximation. It doesn't have to be. It may be that you may have a document that is almost aligned with the query and that the user is not interested in, right? And you may have documents slightly farther away that the user may be interested in. So since anyway, computing the top K on every single document is in the database with the scalar product is already an approximation, then doing yet another approximation with a preselected set of documents is not going to hurt too much. And actually in practice, it works, it works very, very well. So this is the justification for inexact top K document retrieval, right? So instead of all documents, you pre-select documents and you only retrieve the, ex the inexact top 10 or top K in these pre-selected documents. Okay? In practice, it works really, really well. And so I showed you a few examples. The idea is you want to reduce your computation, pre-select documents. So here you have this uh, standard inverted index. Here, by what it is ordered here? Yes? Exactly, by document ID. So we have everything by ascending document ID here. And now we want to compute. Um, so imagine we have the IDFs here. The first thing we can do is to ignore the very low IDFs. So these words maybe are not very relevant in comparison to ETH and Zurich. So the first approximation we can do is just throw away all the documents that are not in these two, even though they would have been here. We throw them away. We only keep the documents that are here. So we only compute the intersection, or rank, sorry, not the intersection would be Boolean retrieval. We only compute the scalar products and the score based on these two posting lists, ETH and Zurich, right? So that's one first idea. idea. And there's many other ideas in the book that I'm going to show you here. Um, it is not an exact science, meaning that there is no absolute way of doing that. It's more a set of ideas that you can use if you have a concrete use case, you need to implement an information retrieval system. You can try them out and see what works best. But depending on the use case, one or the other may work best. So th there is no exact science. So this is the first idea. The second idea was to still consider all posting lists, but try to only keep the documents that contain all terms or maybe many terms. So this document, for example, here would be in all four, so you can keep it. And this one here would only be here. And even worse, it's even a stop word, or you can consider it a stop word. So you know you can throw that away because it only appears, it only has one single term. So this is another way that you can eliminate documents in order to make your overall pre-selected list smaller. And then the next one, I think I started that also last week, is the idea of champion lists. The idea is we have this sorted by document ID, but we can dy dynamically resort it again, but this time by, in by decreasing term frequency. What is the term frequency? Anybody? Yes? Exactly. How often or how many times the term appears in the document? So you sort this by decreasing order. So you're going to have the document that contains that contain many occurrences here and very few occurrences there. And it doesn't go down to zero because otherwise it wouldn't even be in the list. So we sort them by, uh, by the uh, term frequency. And then, um, so we, we do that, we pre-compute that, right? We pick some number r, some constant r, and we keep a list separately from the index for each, for, for each term. We keep a list of the top r documents for each term. And we know that whenever we query for, in that case, ETH or what other words, we looked into this, this champion list that contains the top R documents that contains this term the most. Often it's a champion list. These documents are the champions. And you will only look at this and stop here at runtime, right? So this list of the top R documents is kept separately from the index, right? The indexed is still sorted by document IDs, right? But you keep this list once you have ordered them of the top R documents, right? And then you do it, of course, for each term. So for each term, you will have the list of the champion documents. 
And then at runtime, when you compute the score, you only intersect, I, I basically abuse the term intersect, but I'm sure you understand what I mean here. It means that you compute the scores, uh, the terms of the scalar product, only of the documents from the champion list, and you completely ignore this. So you see it's, a, it's going to be an approximation, but you throw away all of the documents there. Okay? Great. Um, it may also be, remember in that case, that a document may be in the champion list here and may not be in the champion list there, right? So you, you need to keep that it approximates also in that way, that the score will be affected for a document. So what is the difficulty here? The main, the main difficulty, the main, the main challenge. In other words, why do we need to keep that list of the top R documents separately? Could we not just sort them in the index by decreasing term frequency? Then that would be easy. You just look at the, the first R and you're done, right? So why do we do a separate list? Why do we still sort the documents by document IDs? Yes? Yes, I think you got exactly this. this uh, in, to summarize what you just said, the order, if you would sort them by term frequency, the order would not be stable between the terms, and you could not apply this. Uh, so the intersectional, intersection algorithm, but what is the equivalent? I, I keep saying intersection, but what is the equivalence of the intersection algorithm for the ranked retrieval, for the vector space model, when we compute the scalar product? So. Do you remember that there's two ways that you can compute the terms? You can either, either go horizontally or vertically, right? Document at a time, term at a time, right? Assume you want to do it um, term at a time, which would be similar to uh, in Boolean retrieval. So, uh, no, sorry, document at a time. Document at a time is when you go through by increasing document IDs and you process document after document. This only works if your list here are sorted by document IDs or by, by an order that is stable. Who understands this? This is the only way that the intersection algorithm and document at a time can work, right? Who, who doesn't understand? It's okay if you don't. I, I can take one minute and explain it. Can, can you tell me who doesn't understand? Okay, you sure, right? Because it's absolutely no problem to explain. So basically, the difficulty is simply if we want to process this document at a time, document by document, we need the order to be exactly the same in all posting lists. And of course, the term frequency is not such an order. You will have totally different orders for each term. So this is the reason. So the difficulty here, here is that the order of the documents is term dependent. This is the reason why you need to keep this champion list separately and you still need to keep them ordered by document ID if you want to be able to do document at a time. Okay. But there is further ways, so there's a lot of people that has a lot of very crazy ideas, so how can you fix this? This idea of, uh, of having a, an unstable order or an order that depends on the terms. Well, you could design, yes? Yes, so, um, the idea is that there is no exact science, and um, technically the best you could do is choose R dynamically, or that depends on the term, but in practice it simplifies it considerably if you pick R the same everywhere and you pick it statically. This is a difficult question. This is not something that has a definite answer, and it, you, you basically need to do trial and error depending on your use case. It, it really depends what kind of documents you are indexing. Are you indexing books? Are you indexing legal documents? It makes a difference, basically. So it's not an exact science. I leave R being a black box, and it's up to you to figure out its value. I will tell you a bit more about this slightly later uh, regarding this, because there is actually a, a rule of thumb criterion that, that would tell you if you have a good R or if you don't have a good R, right? But this is a very good question, and, and it's not easy to answer. Um, so, sorting documents by term frequencies, 
would not be compatible with document at a time because the order would be dependent on the term. So how do we fix it? We can assign each document a query score that does not depend on the term, right? So it's TF is also a score, kind of. But instead of using the term frequency, you, you use a, a static global document score. Do you have an example of such scores? I'm sure you know one. Very famous. Made billions of dollars with that. Page rank? Exactly what it is. Page rank is uh, such a function G. It assigns to each document statically, globally, a score, and then you can rank them that way. So it's going to be less fine-grained than the term frequency, but still it's already assigning each document a score, and you want to favor the documents that have a higher page rank or a higher score. But here we don't go into the details, it's just some kind of static function that assigns an overall relevance uh, independent of the query, independent on, on the term. It's just a quality assessment of the documents, for example, in zero one. And then what you do is that you can then sort statically in the index by this instead of the document IDs. Instead of sorting by the document IDs, you sort by the score. And then it's compatible with intersecting or doing document at a time computations because the order is the same everywhere. So you can apply the algorithm. Ooh, we're saved. Um, and then we can still use champion lists. We can use actually one single global champion list and we start, and I interpreted the book because they do not really, uh, they, they very quickly go over that, but the idea is that you sum, uh, you compute the scores by summing the, the overall static index, the overall static score of the document with the TFIDFs, um, but for that global champion list, you actually take the max of the TFIDFs, so you, you, you need to get rid of T, right? If you want it to be global, it cannot depend on T. So the way you make it not depend on T is taking the max, and that gives you an overall uh, an overall um, uh, champion list, you take the top R of that and you have a global champions list, right? It's slightly different. In the former case, it was one champion list per term. Here it's a global champion list, right? Do not be afraid, I'm just throwing ideas at you. This is what I'm doing here. And then you pick, you know, the ideas depending on, on your system and what works best. So this is yet another idea where you use the static score and you add the max of the TFIDFs. Um, another thing that you can do, and actually now we're coming back to your question. Um, can you tell me what can happen if you poorly chose R, if you make a very bad choice of R? What could happen? So I want two answers basically. What if you picked R too small? And what if you picked R too big? What, what would happen? You can tell me or anybody else if you have an idea. What, what's the worst that can happen? Let's start with one. Let's imagine that you picked R too big. What will happen? This one is simple actually, yes? It's going to be slow, exactly. And if you take R equal to the overall total number of documents, then you even gain nothing, right? So if you pick R too big, then you are going to be too slow. And maybe the inexact top K document retrieval is not so much worth it anymore. But what happens if on the contrary, you don't want to be too slow, you want to be fast and you're greedy and you want to pick a small R, but you pick your R too small, what happens then? Uh, yes? Yes, that is if you pick R too small, but not too much too small. So if, you, if you're slightly too small, then yes, you may lose a lot of relevant documents. What is the term for that? What do you, what do you lose? Recall, exactly. You, you lose recall. But what if you do an even poorer job and you really take such a small R? This is going to be much worse than just recall, yes? Exactly. So the worst, 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 absolute worst case is you don't find anything. You don't find anything. Um, and before that, in between, you don't find K documents. Maybe you set K equals 10, but you only find five, right? You can only return five documents. So this is what happens if you do a poor choice of R. Uh, you may end up with less documents. How do you solve that when you solve it that way? You solve it by 
keeping a champion list, so you, you, you basically cut your list in two, you have your first list with the, and, and, and you have the, the top R, either by term or globally, so you have your, your list of R documents, and you, keep, you still keep the others somewhere, just in case. So what you do when you compute your query is you use the top R, you use your champions list, you see if you find K documents, if you find K documents, that's it, you return them, you're done. If you do not find K documents, you only find less documents than K, then you fall back to the other list and then run the computations. Okay, this is how you solve it. Who understands this? Very good. So this is, you, you see there are so many ideas in there in order to improve and, and, and make it better. But all the answers you gave are very important. It can be slower, it can be that you reduce recall, it can be that you return less than K documents, or even none at all, which is the, the, the really worst case. Okay, there is yet another idea, which is impact ordering. So impact ordering, the idea is that you sort, you, you tweak a bit the order in the index in order to not, having, to not have to touch the entire index when you query. So the first thing you order, that's not new, we did it a bit before, you sort by IDF, by decreasing IDF. It means that the, um, the words that are very rare would be at the top, and the words that are very, very common, like the stop words, typical stop words, would be at the bottom, okay? And you also sort by, what do you think we can sort here? And yes, I'm going to contradict something that I said earlier, but for good reason. By what can we sort here? Term frequency, right? So let's say we do that. We sort them by term frequency. And then the idea is that in order to uh, do your retrieval, you start here. What do you have here? These are the most, the, the rarest words. And these are first the documents that contain is the most. These are the top documents. These are your favorite documents, the ones you, the ones you want to return first. So the more you are on the top left, the more you want to return these documents, so you can start scanning. You, you, you actually want to scan. Um, yeah, it's actually very high here. So I'm not Al Gore. I don't have this kind of crane that could actually uh, put me higher. But the idea is that you start here and you scan like this. You, you basically start, and when you find K, you stop, right? So the idea is that you scan starting with the documents that have the highest chances, and then go like this, right? This is the idea. You can also only do it stop down. You can also all, only do it left, right. You can combine. It's up to you. But if we do this, we lose something. What do we lose? We lose some capability. And here, we already mentioned that earlier, so you probably know the answer. What can we no longer do? So let me reformulate. Here, we sort it by term frequencies. Thus, what can we no longer do? Yes? I need you to basically add something to your sentence to, to for, the, for the answer to be correct. You can still do the scalar product, but not in a certain way. You, I still give you a chance to answer. Yes, exactly. You can no longer scan document at a time because maybe this document here that is here is very far away there. You know, the, the order is not stable. So if you do that, if you sort your, your, your posting list by uh, term frequency, you can no longer compute your scalar product document at a time. So the advantage of document at a time is that you can stop early. If you have K documents, uh, and, and especially if it's in at that order, you can return them, but you can't do that. You can't do that, so what is the other way you can compute your scalar product then? Is term at a time, right? This is the other way. Term at a time means you don't go document by document, you go term by term. So you basically go through the entire list here, right to left, and then stop, and you put all the terms of the scalar product into the accumulators, and then you do the second term, and then you do the third term, and so on and so on, right? So you have to do it term at a time. Um, but then, of course, you would tell me that 
then it's totally useless. Because if we cannot even do it document at a time, it means we need to go through the entire list here, so we lost the benefits of, of having champions this in the first place, right? It's all a matter of compromises. Th there will be no perfect system. In that case, what you will typically do is you will do it term at a time, but you will maybe stop after a while, after a, a, a number of documents, and then you just forget about the terms. Th there will be missing terms in your Scala product. Maybe there will be a document here that will contribute a term to the scalar product for this term, and maybe that same document is over there, but then you ignored it because it's too far away, your scalar product is going to be an approximation. You will have missing terms, but that's how it is, right? So these are many, many different ideas. They are not all compatible, of course. If you use one ID, you may be not capable of using another ID, so this is why there seems to be contradictions in there. It's all a matter of choices and compromises. Right? So who's the, who has the feeling of having understood all of these ideas in order to accelerate uh, the retrieval? Most of you, okay. So I really recommend, because this is explained uh, in the book, this is all here, chapter six, sec, uh, six seven. Uh, yes, chapter seven. So this is all explained in chapter seven, a rewarding of everything that I've told you in maybe even more developed version, so I encourage you to uh, to read the book. These are many ways of doing inexact top K retrieval. If you understand these things, for example, that if you sort by term frequency and then you can no longer do document at a time uh, um, scalar product computations, then it means you understood a lot, right? If you understand this, it's a very good sign. It means you, you know what's going on, basically. Um, there is one more a way of doing things, it has nothing to do anymore with the, uh, the um, what was done precedently, it's called clustering. It's the idea that we have plenty of documents here that are represented as vectors in our, in our vector space model, right? Each document is a point. And here, I only have two dimensions, but in practice, there's hundreds of thousands, right? It's the terms. Here, I have just two terms. What do I do? I pick random documents, square root of n. So if I have, let's say, 100 documents, I pick 10. If I have 10,000 documents, I pick 100. If I have a million documents, I pick 1,000. The square root, randomly, I just pick random documents. You know how to do that. And then what I do is that I compute clusters, meaning that for all the other documents, I compute the nearest one that we have here. And then I organize all my documents into these clusters. And so when I have a query, all I have to do is find the leader. So you see there's not all documents, but just a smaller set, square root of n. I find the leader, and then I take the cluster, right? And then you only compute the scores for the local cluster, right? For whom is that clear? This is very abstract, but it's very useful to be abstract that way, because we can just talk in pure math. That's beautiful, isn't it? We, we can just use vector spaces and linear models in order to, uh, to find documents, because all we need to do here is find points in a vector space. That's the beauty of the, uh, of the abstraction. Um, we will not have to implement this. You will not have programming assignments. You should just understand the, the abstraction and the high-level the high picture of that. Um, there is a generalization when I told you you can keep a second list to fall back to if you didn't manage to have k documents. Um, you can actually generalize that to more. What you can have is tiered indices. Here's how it works. You still sort by, um, when you pre-process by TFs, IDFs. You chunk, you, 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 you sharp them. Uh, so you basically build tiered champion lists, right? So you have the, f the first R, the next R, and so on and so on. And then you build your tier indices like this. You just reorganize your index like this. So all the top R together, and then the next R, and then the last R. I have an example with just three here, but you can do it with as many as you want. So now, I actually have three separate indices. I have my first index. Maybe it's still sorted by document ID, right, in each index. It's just that in order to split my indices, I put my champion list in there, and then all my posting list sorted by document ID. Then I have tier two, the next R, also maybe sorted by document ID, and then, then tier three. So what do we think we do now in order to compute our query? Which index do we use? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. 
Exactly. That's how it works. Right? It's that simple. We generalize the idea of having to fall back to a different list. So you can see now how it interacts. We have two different orderings. We have the ordering by TF IDFs and the ordering by document IDs to do document at a time. And we can sort by, by um, TF, by, by term frequencies to, to discriminate the indices, to create separate indices. And within each index, we can still sort by document ID and do document at a time, right? Great, so these are tiered indices. Um, now, we are almost at the end of that. We are almost reaching the end. I want to throw, it's very simple, this one. I want to throw one more thing at you. Uh, it's the query term proximity. It's how can you rank? It's a different way of ranking. It's not based on vector space model or something. It's just based on how close the words are. So imagine you're searching for ETH Zurich. And now you have one document that says that one of the two Swiss ETHs is in Zurich. Then you can see the words are at a distance of four, right? One, two, three, four. The, 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 you look for the smallest window that contains the words. Then you have another document that says there's an active ETH cryptocurrency ecosystem in Zug near Zurich. Then, of course, the window is much bigger. You have seven words in there. And then you have ETH Zurich has a department of computer science, magnificence. We have a distance of just two. We have a window of length just two. So how do we sort that? Which document would you like to return with the highest priority, with the highest score? Yes? Yeah, you basically store like this. You start by increasing window size, and that gives you a ranked retrieval system. It's very simple. This, re this system is extremely simple. No scalar products, nothing. Just look for the windows. So we return this first, and then this, and then this. And the farther away they are, uh, the, the more down the list they are going to be when you return. Okay? This is very simple, and it gives you another way of ranking your documents. Query term proximity is called. And you can, for example, take the top two. That's one way of doing it. Okay, so now just to finalize, this is actually now the big picture. We are summarizing everything we've been doing until now in one bigger picture. Um, what kind of queries did we have when you input your query? Since the beginning of the semester, we've looked into Boolean queries, rank retrieval, and so on. What kind of queries do we have? Right? We, are, we are zooming out now. We are looking at the entire everything we've been doing. Yes? Just text, free text. So I'm not sure in what order I have them. Oh, I actually, okay, I started with that one. So the first one we've been doing was Boolean queries. Right? It's the idea of having this very simple grammar with or, or, and, and not. And this is the first week that you have implemented. What do you use for that? What index structure? the standard inverted index, right? With intersections and unions and so on. Then you had the phrase queries. It's still not the one you mean, right? You mean the free text query, right? So this is the phrase queries. What kind of indices did we use for that? Two possibilities. The byword index, does it ring a bell? It's the, the same as the standard inverted index, but with pairs of words. So we would have ETH Zurich, and then Zurich computer, and then computer science, and then we intersect, right, by words. And the other one that we can use is positional index. You keep the positions of the words in your index, and then you check that the positions are next to each other, three, four, five, six, for example. Okay, here's another one. Zone queries, I hope I didn't forget yours. Zone queries, it's the idea that it's the good old libraries. You input a title, an author, and so on, and you, find, you try to find exact matches. Maybe you can also do full text. These are zone queries. And then, this is the one you mentioned earlier, sets of words. It's the way almost everybody types in Google. If you, if you look at Google queries, this is the way that most people use Google. You just type a set of words. This is actually the one we use for the vector space model, ranked retrieval. We use this um, paradigm. And then you can also have wildcards. We also spend some time. We can use k-gram indices in order to solve that one. Wildcard queries. That's a lot of ways we can query is rare, right? And, and then, depending on um, the kind of query, you can pick a model in order to query. The Boolean model, the ranking, the ranked retrieval, the vector space model. Uh, query proximity, uh, word proximity, and so on and so on. 
right? So I just summarized again what typically you can use uh, in there. And how does it fit in the very big picture? You typically have the collection of documents that you want to index. So you pass, you do some linguistics. Remember, if you want to do to stem or to do some lemmatization in order to, uh, to fine to, to fine tune the terms, you typically cache the documents. This is one of the incredible things when, when uh, um, Larry Page and Sergey Brin created Google, they basically said, we are going to download the entire web. We are going to download the entire internet. And yes, in essence, this is what they've been doing because you do keep the document in a cache somewhere. This allows you to, re you, when you, you know, when you return the results, you can show a snippet of the documents and highlight the words that you found. So this is what the document cache is useful for. And then you index, and here, there's nothing new here. We've been doing all of that. Uh, you build the indices. You can have zone indices. You can have the inexact Tom K retrieval indices, what we've been doing today. You can have the tiered inverted positional indices. That's tiered, for example, the way I showed you with the top R and the next R and so on. And you can have positions in there. You can have byword indices for phrase queries. You can have k-gram indices for spelling correction and so on and so on. So you can build all your indices in there. Then the user query arrives, can be in one of these five ways that I've shown you. Uh, you have a query parser, can be the Boolean parser, the free text parser, and so on. You may do some spelling correction with the k-gram index and fix the query and something. And then you query the index. And then you, it's called, actually it's a fancy word for evidence accumulation. It's actually when you compute the scalar product, you know, when, when you go through either document at a time, document by document, or term at a time, term by term, when you accumulate the terms of the scalar product, you're actually accumulating evidence that the document is relevant. This is the very generic and fancy term for that. Evidence accumulation, we just look at all the indices and try to contribute scores. Um, and then we may wait if we have, for example, the zones uh, or uh, you, you know the, the, the way we wait, for example, TFIDF and so on and so on. We may have weights that we use in there. It's mostly for the zone indices, I think, the weights. And then we, co we combine that, and then we get a scoring, and we can rank the documents and return the results with the snippets from the cache. Right? And then I told you this is outside of the scope of the course, but if you have any weights anywhere, you can simply use machine learning. In order to set the weights, you, you use a training set, and then you can finally compute the weights. Right? And so that's it. That's basically the, uh, the overall architecture of everything we've been doing. You know, this is how it fits together. And you see it's pretty amazing all the things you can do, right? All the indices that now you are capable of building, the uh, queries you are capable of supporting, the framework of scoring and ranking that you can do, or maybe none at all. If you do Boolean retrieval, there's no scores. Uh, OK, so who, who understands this big picture? This is very important here. This is really a summary of everything we've been doing. Very good. And it's also summarized in, uh, in the book. So if I'm correct, it stops here, yes? So I will give you even two more minutes of break as a reward that you are following. Um, I will see you at quarter past 10. And at quarter past 10, I will start. It, it's, we are entering the fancy slash advanced part of the lecture here. Uh, Again, you won't have to implement. You, you will just have a few theoretical exercises. We are going to see how you can use probabilities in order to design yet another new way of querying documents. That's why I have this fancy type here. It's a cheat sheet, just in case I forget some of the formulas. Uh, but don't be scared. I will be very slow. I will take you through all of this. Um, so I'll see you at a quarter past 10, right after the break. I have very good news. I have to catch my breath a bit. I ran to the uh, IT support, and we solved the network problem. So I should be able now to use the uh, clicker app again. Um, probabilistic information retrieval. Do not be scared. Um, this is a new way of um, doing information retrieval. And then when we are done, I, I'm going to show you that it's actually not a new way. Um, first, we need to brush up a bit on probabilities. I assume you all know who attended the probabilities lectures, all of you, right? So you know probabilities. So I will need to brush up a bit, just put everything back into memory 
the way that I need it, very formally. I, I love to, to put that every time just to make sure that you see the difference, the set of word model, the Boolean retrieval, and then on the other hand, the ranked model with the bag of word and so on. Anyway, probability theory. Um, can anybody tell me what, because you visited the courses, what is the probability? Yes? Sorry, I, need, I didn't hear you. Can you repeat, please? Yeah. It is a number between 0 and 1. Yes, that is correct. Something else, if you want to define it more precisely, like what does it mean? What is the semantics? Yes? Yes, so what's very interesting is what you said is you connected probabilities to statistics, meaning that you would estimate probabilities based on how, how often in a set of large scale experiments it repeats. This is actually very popular in quantum physics um, where you, you have no other choice. I mean, quantum physics can do no better than giving you some probability that an outcome will come out of measurements, like is the cat alive, is the cat dead, it's one half, one half. Um, and the way, indeed, as you said, you can, you can uh, pick a million cats, put them into boxes, and notice that half of them survive, and this corresponds to the probability of one half. Don't worry, we are not going to do an ex any experiments on cats. But basically, the probability can be seen as a counterpart of statistics. This is one way of putting it. It can also be seen as an uncertainty. Then, of course, there's the question, is it an a real uncertainty, like seems to be the case as many physicists think is the case in quantum physics. There is a real randomness. Randomness is an important word as well. If there is a real randomness, then probability accounts for that, but it can also account for uncertainty. For example, if I would close everything and ask you, is it raining outside? Well, it is either raining or not raining, but if you don't know, then you can use the probability to model your uncertainty about the fact that it's raining or not. So we, we are going to do a little bit of gymnastics with that, of course, in the context of document retrieval, so of information retrieval, so we are going to use documents and queries uh, in there. Um, so very good, so this is the, the basics. But now, can you tell me, no longer in terms of interpretation of probability, but in terms of formalism, what is the mathematical formalism to define very formally and precisely probabilities. Can anybody tell me, do you remember? Fancy Greek letters? The last letter of the Greek alphabet? Anybody? Does omega ring a bell? Omega, right? Big omega. This is how we define probabilities in math, very formally. We have a universe of possibilities. This universe of possibilities is called big omega. Who already saw that? Right, you did. And inside this big omega, we have these little uh, points here. The, in the elementary events, there's many ways to call that outcomes, elementary events. Maybe you even saw others. But these are the single, it's, it's like atoms. It's a single event um, that belongs to this set omega. And typically, we call them small omega. Um, so this is the way it's done, and how do, do we now define probabilities with this? So you told me it's between 0 and 1. How could we define something between 0 and 1 based on that? It's a function, right, that assigns zero, something between 0 and 1. You already saw that. Normally it should... Uh, I'm never sure if you don't answer it's because it's so easy and you already know it, so... Uh, you don't dare to answer, or is it because you're not following? But I'm assuming you know all that. We are only brushing up something you already know. I want to be extremely clear on that. So, uh, a probability is simply a function that goes from big omega to zero one, the interval zero one, and it associates with each elementary events uh, from probability here. And uh, when we sum them all, it must come to one. Again, we love, we love renormalizing, so this is yet another example of renormalizing. If you do the statistical experiment, it only means divided by the total number of experiments. Okay, 
So we have this big omega. We have here, I have just an example with five, and that's an assignment of probabilities in there. Good. Now, we can define events based on that. An event, what is it, an event? You should know that. You should all know that. Who knows what an event is? Very good. So can, can anybody tell me? It's just a subset of omega. That's what it is. It's a subset of omega. And if what actually occurs in reality belongs to that subset, then the event occurs, right? An event is just a subset. What's the probability of an event? It's simply the sum of the probabilities of what's inside. OK? You, you know all that. I, I really, I just, I'm just refreshing here. Then we have the notion of complements, which is just the complement of an event is just all the elementary events outside of that event. And of course, the probability is 1 minus. Okay? So if my, if my event happens once out of three times, then the complementary happens two out of three times. Okay? Then what do I have? I have odds. We are going to use them today. But I'm not sure it's not necessarily covered in any lecture. Do you know what odds are? Who never saw odds? Okay, I assume that. It's actually very simple. You probably notice in the bet agencies, there's a lot in the UK, for example, when, when you have the bets, they do not uh, use probabilities, they use odds. So instead of telling you it's one chance in two, they'll just say it's one against one. So the, the way you get that is very simple. You just divide the probability by the probability of the complements. So if you have a probability of 0 0.1, so a probability of 10%, the odd is one in one of one against, never sure about the proposition, yes. Nine, exactly. It's one against nine. One plus nine equal there. OK. So um, it's one ninth, basically. It's a fraction. Very good. So this is an odd. It's very important because we are going to use them today. They will allow us to get rid of stuff. You will, you will see. Um, then we have the intersection. The intersection of two events is just the intersection of the two sets. And there is the union then, which is also the union of the two sets. So an, uh, the union of two events happens if at least one of the events happens. The intersection happens if both happen. And then you have this beautiful formula that you all know that links the probability of the union and of the intersection. So the probability of the union is the sum minus the probability of the intersection. OK? Right. And now I had questions to brush up. Uh, So first, let's try with uh, this one. I really want you to answer as quickly as possible. This is all stuff you already know. I just want to, uh, to retrieve it in your brains. So which one of the following, the following does not always apply? Is it that the sum of the probabilities is always 1? Is it that each elementary event must have a probability of either 0 or 1? Is it that a probability must always be positive? Or a probability, the probabilities of elementary events must always be equal. It must always be uniform in omega, and then, of course, for the events, not necessarily. So what is wrong here? What should I remove? Does anybody need more time? OK, let me close. You got it correctly. So yes, there's several answers possible. So um, this is not true. You can have any number, a decimal between 0 and 1. And this is also not true. It can totally be not uniform. Uniform is a special case. It doesn't have to be. Very good. And the probability is always between 0 and 1 and sums to 1. We saw that. But now, maybe think a little more. Two of these statements are true. Which ones? Basically, I'm just asking, what does it mean to be independent or disjoint in terms of probabilities? And then you just need to find the right combination with intersection or union, product or sum, and that's it. You just need to find the, the two correct ones.
maybe I can start showing the results. It's going to be funny if it is one of these. It's interesting. Okay. Okay, so let me close 14. Ah, interesting. You see how observing something modifies the reality. These were the two correct answers. Independent means that the probability of the intersection is the product. And disjoint means you can sum. And it's actually very easy to see because disjoint just means this is the empty set. And then you can see that this is the sum of just the two. This doesn't exist. So disjoint events is just like this. You sum. And uh, this is also a partition rule can be useful. Uh, if you, ca you can partition an event E, for example, between the part that is outside of F and the part that is inside F. So all you say is that it's E intersecting with F plus the probability of E intersecting with non-F. That's called the partition rule. Uh, then we have the notion of conditional probability. It's the idea of a probability of an event, but knowing that the event F happened. And the way you get that is the probability of the intersection divided by the total probability of f. But actually, visually, it's very easy to understand because all you do is, it's as if instead of omega, you replace omega with f. You know, because if you know f, then every, anything outside of f, you know it's not true. So all you do is renormalize the probability of e, but renormalize on f, right? This is what you do here. Who understands this? This is extremely important. We are going to use that. That's the conditional probability. And the chain rule is that the probability of the intersection, meaning the probability that, that both E and F happen, is the probability that one happens multiplied by the probability that the other happens, but knowing that the first one happens. That's called the chain rule. You also know that. And then if they are independent, then all that means is that here, this disappears. Because you, you, they are independent, so it's P of E times P of F. That's what independent means. I wrote it right here. This is just the chain rule, but you no longer need the conditions on F because they are independent. OK. Now I'm going to do the switch to Bayesian stuff. Uh, who is aware of the Bayesian stuff, the Bayes formula? You also saw it. We are going to use that. We are going to do magics with that. There is a puzzle. You're going to have another one in the exercises. If it rains, I forget my umbrella 5% of the time. It rains every other, other day, and last year I had my umbrella on 271 days. What is the probability that it's raining today? So you see that here, it's a probability in the sense of uncertainty. It's not that we are going to throw a dice and then see if it rains or not, depending on the dice. It's really that you don't know if it's raining. You want to know le, the likelihood, if you want, that it is raining. So how do you do that? Very quickly, can somebody tell me? Anybody? It's very important because we are just going to replace the brain and the, um, the, the, uh, the rain and the umbrella with information retrieval stuff. So it's very important you get that. Yes? Is there a space for the yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. You got it. So now I'm giving you the details. That's exactly it. So this is the visual representation. It's raining, or, and you take your umbrella, and there's an intersection somewhere. And here I'm telling you what's the probability. This is once you, I give you this information. If it rains, uh, there's 95% of chance I have my umbrella. This is not at scale, of course. So this is as if, if you know it rains, then your omega becomes this. It's basically reducing the space. This is the other one. It's the we tend to call it likelihood in that direction because this is really a parameter. So it's the likelihood or the probability that it's raining given that I have my umbrella, right? So these are the two we want to link. And instead, and in, indeed, so these are the two things. And we want to use the base formula around the intersection of the two, that it's both raining and I have my umbrella. And this is how you get base formula. It's actually with the chain rule. You just express the first chain rule 
that it rains plus I take my um, uh, sorry multiplied by I take my umbrella given that it rains and the exact same thing in the, the other direction this is the chain rule and what you get is this wonderful base formula that we are going to be using in information retrieval it's exactly what you said you call that a and b I just use these little pictures this is base formula and then this formula actually here is just like a little wizard that is capable of transforming a probability that I have my umbrella given the fact that it rains and this little wizard the base formula transforms it into a probability that it rains given the fact that I have my umbrella right this is what base is all about and of course there's people you know there's all these philosophical debates can we do that and does it make sense and so on and so on but mathematically it's just correct so it actually turn, comes down to the interpretation of probabilities so all you need to do is replace all of this in there 95 05 the days and what you get is 64 percent of probabilities that it is raining so the visual representation is this I had my umbrella 271 percent uh, of a year then I only forget it 5 percent of the rainy days it rains 50 percent of the time and this is the magical trick this is incredible this is when we do the trick it rains 50 percent of the time but if I add the information that I have my umbrella you can see that I, I do this, this shrinking of omega to the facts that I have my umbrella because I have this information and then 50 becomes 60 right this is why what it's all about so if you now look at the little wizards what it does you can view it in so many different ways uh, you have the prior the probability that is waning was 50 percent and then you multiply it with this quotient here and what you get is the probability that it rains given the umbrella so this is called the prior and this is called the posterior right this is called the posterior so we are upgrading we we knew we we had an a probability it was it was raining then somebody comes and tell you hey by the way I have my umbrella additional information so I upgrade all my computations to get this new probability my posterior okay who is following okay it's very important we are going to do that with documents and queries who is comfortable with that who is not comfortable with that it's okay it's okay to tell me I mean I know there's a lot of formulas who is not comfortable Okay, I, I'm assuming probably some of you aren't but don't dare to tell but it's totally okay I'll, I'll be careful so this is the base rule if I come back to this representation right here um, with my posterior and my prior and here now I need random variables this is the one thing that I'm adding on top of bias because I will need random variables what is a random variable can anybody tell me in simple words Just a few words, yes? Yes, except it doesn't have to be the real numbers. It can be anything. Yeah, any set. So here I'm using little shapes and colors. So I have a set, the target set, but yes, it can be the real numbers, can be the Boolean numbers, can be documents, can be queries. It's actually going to be documents and queries. So I have here my target set and I assign to each elementary event a random variable and what is the probability that the random variable is equal to a given value how do you get that what is it if I tell you the random variable the, the value of this variable is equal to for example the blue square what, what is this what what is this mathematical object the value of the variable is the blue square what did I yeah 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 it's very important to understand this this is an event each value of the random variable gives you an event which is a set of the element it, it's basically the reverse image of all the elementary events that map to that value so the formula is exactly the same formula as for events you sum over the elementary events for all those that has this uh, this value for the random variable for example this is the probability that the, the random variable equals to x and you sum you take all the elementary events for which it's equal to x and you get that for example the blue square it's 0 0.5 the triangle is 0 0.5 and uh, the pentagon is 0 0.1 and yes it doesn't sum to one and I didn't pay attention but <laughs> that's that's it um, 
So this is a random variable. Very important, I, I, I really want to do it very correctly, formally, and the book doesn't. So this is why I'm telling you to be very careful. I have this probability, P, can be small, uh, uppercase, lowercase, I may actually use both. But here, this probability distribution over the random variable, it should have this little x in there to say that this is a function that maps a, a value of the random variable, so the space of random variables, to 0, 1. Okay? So I need to specify that it's x. This is very important. Right? So what you write is actually this. And uh, yes, I, didn't, I don't know what I was drinking when I wrote the slides, but it doesn't sum to 1, but yeah. Uh, so you basically write that p indexed by the random variable, the, 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 the symbol of the random variable, equals something, okay? But actually, this is very cumbersome to write. So what you, um, what you do in practice, um, oh yeah, that's one thing you do in practice. This is actually why it's very tricky to, to really get random variables. In practice, even though we define random variables in top of an omega set, even though we do that, in practice, we forget about the omega set, right? You probably saw it in many lectures where you use random variables. You, you drop the omega set, you, you hide it somewhere, like, like put, putting the dust under the carpet, and all you do is deal with the set S, and then you have this probability. It looks like a probability distribution on S, but what it really is is a random variable on top of, uh, of uh, omega. So you have this, and there is an alternate notation, and this is the one we are going to use, which is this, right? These are the two ways, and the only two ways that I allow you to write uh, probabilities on a random variable as is here. This is the induced function, and this is in terms of events. This is the probability of the event that the random variable equals blue is this, okay? These are the only two notations that I allow you to use, and we are going to use that one, which is the easier, easier to understand, okay? This is a no-go. You are not allowed to do that. You are not allowed to put the value of a random variable just inside P without saying which random variable it is, or without specifying it in here. Uh, the reason is that it's extremely confusing and it's mathematically incorrect, because the only thing you can put inside P is an elementary event or an event, the value of a random variable is not an event. What is an event is the fact that the random variable x or y may be equal to a value. I forbid you to do that, okay? So it's very unfortunate that the book does that, but you should be aware. You know, there, in, in, in practice, a lot of people actually do that. They basically, um, I mean, of course, if you have a PhD in probabilities and so on, you can do that because you know what you are doing and you basically save some, some energy when you don't write it. But imagine there's two random variables, x and y. And now, what a lot of people do is they, they write this, p of x, p of y, when x is in the space of x, y is in the space of y. And then they think, oh, it's clear for the context, I use the small x, so it's, of course, the probability what is actually meant is the probability that random variable x equals small x, and here what's actually meant is that the probability of y equals small i. Mathematically, this is incorrect because you have no idea uh, what random variable you mean, and you should not rely on the name of the variable you're using. That's a no-go, right? So you should explicitly write every time which random variable equals each value. I will very carefully do that through the entire lecture, but in the book, you should have no problem understanding it but because they do that. But whenever they use a small d, you know it's actually the document random variable. Whenever they use q, you know it's the query random variable. But I will, do, I will try to do it as cleanly as possible. I think it's also much better pedagogically for you to understand what's going on. Okay, so enough about that. Don't, don't do that. Um, and then, and you, you see why it's so important to always be explicit, you have the joint probability, so if you have x, y here as, a, as an index, of x and y, it's a function that associates each value x and each value y with a probability, and here you see it's again an event, it's the event that x equal x and y equal y, that's an event as well. Then you have the conditional probability, you also saw that, which is the division of the joint probability by uh, the probability of the condition, okay? 
you saw that as well. And of course, in practice, I actually prefer to write it that way. So you can either write it with the little uh, uh, script, subscripts right here. This is much better. I find it so much easier to read in terms of events. So it's basically the probability of the events that x equals x condition on the event that y equals y. And then it's basically the same formula as we saw before, right, with e and f. Who is following? Right? You know all that, but I wanted to make the formalism extremely clear. OK, and do not do that. Again, here they do that everywhere in the book, but do not do that. Here they, they assume, OK, you know it's x, you know it's y, but no, you don't. You actually have to be explicit on which random variable is equal to y, what, what value. Right? OK. So now that we have summarized all of this, let us take this to document retrieval. And based on this, based on Bayesian uh, formalism, we are going to define yet another way of designing an information retrieval system. I would like you to stop me anytime something is unclear, because that, that's going to be a lot of formulas. We are going to manipulate formulas. It's like cooking, you know? Like you, you, you watch TV, somebody's cooking. You can pause whenever you don't see which ingredients got where. It's exactly the same thing. Stop me if. You don't understand what I'm doing. Very important. So I told you a random variable maps this big omega space to some other space. And we are going to have three random variables, q, d, and r. q is the probability. Uh, so, so q is the random variable of query. So each little omega in big omega is associated with a query. It's like you would throw a dice, and then, bam, you get a query, right? So this is a query random variable. I, I use the uppercase Q to design the random variable Q, and a lowercase Q for one single given query, right? So then you can have the event that the query is, for example, ETH Zurich. When I tell you the query is ETH Zurich, that's an event. Right? That the random variable Q is equal to the query TH3. OK. So I have this. And then it's actually very easy. I do the same with documents. Uh, it's basically I'm returning a document. So in each little omega, um, I'm returning a document for some query. This is what I'm doing. So I'm mapping each little omega as well to a document. I'm using the uppercase D for the document random variable and lowercase D to designate one precise document, yes? Omega is actually what we are going to put back under the carpets. Um, so it's exactly the core of doing Bayesian, Bayesian stuff, basically. This is also the reason why it's debated, and some people uh, um, have, uh, have um, second thoughts or at least disagree on, on, on doing that. But the idea is that um, omega is only a mathematical um, object that allows us to give a precise meaning to sentences such as, if the query is this, then there is so and so much probability that I'm going to return that document, and there is so and so much probability the document is going to be relevant. You can also do sentences like, if you don't know the query, like you hide the query, somebody tells you, OK, I return the document of the home page of ETH. What could the query be? And then you have a probability distribution of what the query could be depending on the fact you know you returned the page and you know it was relevant. So when you, do, um, when you use the Bayesian way of, uh, of, um, of uh, accounting with reality and such sentences, you always need an omega because this is what you need for, this, for all these formulas to be defined. But actually, you do not even talk about omega at all. It's like everybody knows it's there. There is this mathematical formalism, but you will very soon see that for the rest of the lecture, I'm not even going to talk about omega anymore. And then you can actually refer to your intuition when, because the sentences that I told you, what are the odds that if I returned uh, the home page of ETH and it was relevant, what are the odds that the query was ETH Zurich? You understand what I'm telling you, right? It's intuitive. This is the way to do it formally and mathematically correct with this omega. This is why we are doing that. But you will see very soon I get rid of it. And, and then you will see it's very, um, it's going to be intuitive. 
But this is like paperwork. This is the paperwork we need in order to be allowed to write the formulas and have a, a, a formal way of saying this formula is correct or incorrect. It's like when you have actions uh, uh, and, 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 and um, systems of theorems that rely on actions, you, you need so, somewhere a truth, a way of saying if it's true or if it's false. It's the same thing. So do not be scared of this omega because we are going to give them up very, very soon and put them under the carpet. Did it answer your question? Yes. Okay. Um, you know that this Bayesian stuff, you, you, you can use, I think one of them is called as Russell's paradox. Uh, you, you, you have very intuitive results that, that come from that. The fact that, that you can say, for example, is there life on other planets? You can ask the question, what's the probability that there is life on other planets, given the fact that we know there's billions of planets in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in our galaxy? It basically upgraded our probability because 20 years ago we didn't know there was billions of planets. So you can use Bayesian analysis in order to decide what are the odds that we are not alone in the universe, right? But this is based, basically, it's already either true or false whether we are alone or not, right? So all of this Bayesian reasoning, is, it's just to reason with uncertainty, right? Uh, and the way you would reason on that is as if you would say, let's consider plenty of possible worlds, and in some of the worlds we are alone, in some other worlds we are not alone, in some other worlds there's billions of other planets, and so on. This is a purely mathematical framework in order to give meaning to all these sentences, even though these sentences actually are intuitive to us, right? It's, it's really necessary paperwork. Okay. So don't be mad at me that I'm throwing omega in there. It will disappear very quickly. We just needed that. So we have this query random variable, the document random variable, and the relevance random variable. For each elementary event where I return the document for a query, either it was relevant or not. This is a Boolean random variable that is either zero or one, okay? So we have Q, D, and R, and for the remainder of this lecture, and next week I'm going to do, to, to do magics using these three random variables. So why are we doing that? And now you, you can see I threw, now I threw away omega. You will not, I think you will not see omega again in case you were scared by it. So you can now refer to your intuition because we've taken part care of the paperwork. We are asking the question, given a user that entered the query queue, and I give you the information the user said, for example, ETH Zurich, or uh, butterflies in Switzerland, or whatever, given the query and given the documents, what is the probability that this document is relevant against the query, meaning that the random variable R is equal to one. Not, I, not that I have done this paperwork, this has a meaning, and that meaning corresponds to the intuition. So now, if I have the probability that given Q and D, D is relevant for Q, R equals one, how can I use that in information retrieval? I give you a query, I give you a bunch of documents, so you can plug it whatever document you want in there. Can you give me an information retrieval system? How can I get a ranked retrieval system with that? It's very simple, actually. So this here, how many, how many uh, variables are there? How many parameters are there in there? In order, so this has a value. What are, what are my uh, non-mute variables? What can I plug it in there? What can I plug in there? Q and D, right? These are the ones I can plug in there. Everything else is just uh, is just the rest of the formula. So I can put any query here and any document here and then compute this and this gives, this gives me a number, right? So now let's say I have the query. So I, I, have the, I know exactly what Q I want to put in there. And let's say I have 100 possible values for D and for each one of these uh, d these documents, I have let's 100 ones, I compute this big number, putting the query in there and putting each one of the 100 documents in there, that gives me 100 numbers, one for each document. Which documents should I return to you? Yes? Yes, exactly. You should return the documents that have the highest probability of relevance. And the idea is that so this is just a visual because you have the random variable D and Q. So you have the events that the document is D and the event that Q is Q. And then condition on these two, so the intersection, you look is R1 or zero. 
So you are going to give, like I have four documents in there, D, E, F, and G. For each one of these documents, the probability that it's relevant, given the query, is here very, very small. Here, it's very, very big. So this is the ideal world. It's here either 0 or 1. So in the ideal world where either it's relevant or not, here you would just return these two, right? Because they are very relevant, they are not relevant. Of course, in practice, that's not how it's going to be. You're going to have like real numbers between zero and one. And as you said, we rank this. This is, you know, this probability is very big. This document F, the, the probability that it's relevant against query Q is very high. So we rank, we sort, and then we can even take the top two or the top three or do something like top K retrieval. We have a ranking system. We have a scoring system. We use that as the score, right? Do you understand that? Who understands that we got a whole new information system that gives you score-based results? Who understands this? Okay. So now, the trick is how do we compute that? This is now the difficult and mathematical part, but the essence of it is exactly that, is to optimize the probability of relevance. So the idea of Boolean retrieval is that you return a document, if you want to booleanize it, you compute these probabilities. This is the same one, but it's the probability that it's not relevant. So the probability that it's relevant should be higher than the probability that it's not relevant, which is exactly the same as saying that it's more than one half. Uh, because if it's more than one half, then it's higher probability that it's relevant. So if, if it's this setting that for D and Q, it's more than one half, you return the documents. If it's less than one half, you do not return the document. Now we have a Boolean system. It's no longer a ranked system, it's a Boolean system. So we can get both of them, right? So this is the idea of Boolean retrieval. You return if it's more than one half, if the odds are very good, okay? There is another way. I'm not going to say much about that, but it's just to show you before we actually go into the math. This is in terms of costs. You can actually compute the costs. Here is a contingency table. You can either return or not return the documents. If you return the documents and it was relevant, then you're very happy. Doesn't cost you anything. If you did not return a not relevant document, then you're very happy. You did your job. The two bad things got, that can happen is you returned a non-relevant document that's bad for precision, or you did not return a relevant document that's bad, that's bad for recall. These are the two things that can go wrong. You can assign costs to them, C0 and C1. And when you assign costs, then you can compute the difference of costs between returning and not returning. And the bigger the difference, of course, in that direction, the, the, if the costs for returning are much lower in expected value than the costs of not returning, then you can return the documents. That, what that means is that, so this is just, again, saying what I did. This is the cost of returning an irrelevant document, very bad. And this is the cost of not returning a relevant document. And guess what? If you actually consider the costs the same, it's just as bad, precision or recall, so just C instead of C0 and C1, and you simplify the formula, guess what you get? You actually get exactly this, that you end up actually sorting by decreasing value of that. So it falls back to what I told you earlier, right? So this is the really, the, the one thing that we want to optimize is that, okay? So remember this formula because this is the one that we are going to spend a lot of time trying to compute. So now I want to tell you a bit, just be, before we go into that, which is probably going to be next week, what abstraction do we have in there? Because I told you, um, we have these three random variables. We have the query, the document, and the third one. D, Q, and, yes? R, R, the relevance, exactly. So we have these three. But I was very vague. I just told you there's a space of documents, there's a space of queries, but I didn't define what the space of documents or the space of queries is, right? And we already went through that in the preceding weeks. I told you we can consider that the documents and queries are just sets of words. We can consider that they are bags of words. We can consider that they are vector spaces with points and so on. There's many, many, many ways. And what we are going to do here is use set of words semantics. It means that 
I am only interested in knowing, in defining a document with the set of terms that it contains, and the same for the query. So I am in set of words. And that means that I, I can express documents and queries as vectors that contain what? Set of words, what, what is there in here? Real numbers, booleans, strings, set of words, right? Yes? One or zero, exactly. We have vectors that only contain ones and zeros. If it's one, it means that the term here, number one, appears in document D. If it's zero, Q2 is zero, it means that the term number two does not appear in query Q. So it's back to the, the old times where we were using Booleans. We have vectors of Booleans. That means that my random variables D and Q, they map, oh, I said I would no longer talk about the omega space. So the target space of D and Q are simply vectors of zeros and ones. That's it. So that, that actually means that I can put, do not watch on the left, I promise you I would no longer show you the omega. It means that I can have an index in there for each random variable D, I can index it by term. And that gives me a random variable that is just Boolean. This means ETH appears in the documents and this is zero or one, okay? Very good, and I can do the same with many terms, with ETH, with information. So it means that if I'm using the set of words models, I can represent my documents and queries as vectors of zeros and ones, and that gives me one random variable, even for each term. So I can define events such as the return document contains the word ETH, or the query contains the word information, and so on and so on. So these are more fine-grained random variables, but they are random variables like any other, right? It's just that they are Booleans, and that simplifies, that simplifies life a lot for us. So it means that now we can, now I forgot the end, write things like this. I can no longer just write what's the probability that the, the document is D conditioned on a query ends with the knowledge that it's relevant. I can now even say what is the probability that my document contains the term K or not, depending if here I put a zero or a one. Uh, what's the probability that my document contains term K Deep, knowing that it's relevant and knowing that the query was ETH Zurich. Okay? Do you understand this? Who does? Very good. So, the ID now, so I just wrote what I just said to explain what that is. And now, I'm going to make an assumption, and this is where I end the lecture, but I'm sure you will understand this. How can I express now the probability that my document is a given vector? but decomposed against each term. What do you think is going to appear in there if I tell you that the terms appear independently in documents? What is going to be here? A sum, a product, what do I have? They are independent. Can anybody tell me? Yes? Product, exactly. Independence, you should think product. So this is what I get. The probability, if I give you, D is a vector, because now I told you we have a vector of Booleans. So if I give you a vector of Booleans, the probability that the document is that vector of Boolean that I'm giving you, this event, it's made of plenty of, the con it's the conjunction of plenty of independence events that the document contains or not, depending on the vector, term one, multiplied by the probability that it does not, if it's zero, contains term two, multiplied by the probability that it does contain term three, if it was a one, and so on. Who understands this? Okay, this is called the, uh, um, I never remember the exact wording, the binary independence model, BIM, the binary independence model. This is exactly this, we assume that the terms appear independently on documents, and this is why I can write this as a product, okay? So this is the preparation uh, of er all the tools that we need for the other time. And now, what we are going to do is try to estimate, to find a way to estimate this thing here, the probability of relevance for each possible document value, rank them, 
And we are going to just do some cooking. We are going to use the base. You probably guess that we are going to invert this with the base formula. And then we are going to find out how to compute this thing, right? All you need to understand now is that we want to rank by that, and we refresh a bit the probabilities for that, OK? So let me just, because it's the end of the lecture now, check if you followed, and then you can go. Um, OK, I don't have the question here. So who has the feeling that they understood a lot of what I said today? Who is lost? Nobody? Very good. So enjoy the exercise session. It's in exact top K document retrieval. No pressure. It's not graded. This is all done now for the bonus point. So you, all you need to do is wait to get the answer from the TAs. So you can do the exercise if it helps. Next week, you will get exercises on the probability, uh, uh, probabilistic information retrieval. It's going to be the last exercise. Then I, 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 I let you um, get a bit of, uh, of rest, and I will tell you about, more about the exam, right? Uh, so um, I will still teach you other things, but it's going to be over for the exercises. So en enjoy the exercise session, and I'll see you next week at 9 AM in this same room.